I'm Kathy and I'm an addict. Hey, Kathy. Hey, Kathy. This is the one, I'm reading these instructions. Uh, please, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is the, uh, the statement to the press. The principle of personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films found in our 11th tradition are very important to Narcotics Anonymous. It is the anonymity found in our traditions that protect us, protect our groups, and to addicts without fear of public exposure. If there are any members of the press present, we ask that you help maintain our 11th tradition and speak with one of the committee members for more information. To op we're going to open this with a moment of silence by the, by the serenity prayer. God, God grant me serenity, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And this is where I'm supposed to introduce myself. I'm Kathy, and I'm an addict. Um, Welcome to Gretna 35, adding to our story. Our intention for this convention is to make available to our fellowship a weekend of recovery, celebration, and fun. We hope that our addicts receive the NA message of recovery while they are attending this event. It is our hope that the message we carry may truly let all individuals know that NA is a place to recover and that no addict seeking recovery need to die from addiction. Please be aware that your behavior when dealing with convention center staff and property. Our personal conduct is direct reflection of our recovery in action. Notify committee members or convention center security if necessary. All meeting workshops and activities that are inside are non-smoking, non-vaping. Smoking is permitted outside only. Please dispose of cigarettes properly. Clarity statement. In Narcotics Anonymous, we are presented with a dilemma. When NA members identify themselves as addicts and alcoholics or talk about being clean and sober, the clarity of the NA message is diluted. To speak in this manner suggests that there are two diseases, that one drug is separate from the rest. Our identification as addicts is all inclusive, allowing to concentrate on our similarities, not our differences. This statement is offered in the spirit of NA unity. Please remember that this request is not being made in order to rule, sense, or dictate behavior. We make this request in order to provide an atmosphere of recovery where we can all hear the clear, unconfused, life-saving message of Narcotics Anonymous. And we have an addict that's going to read how it works. I'm Lisa, I'm an addict. Hey Lisa. Lisa. Hi, that's how it works. If you want what we have to offer and are willing to make an effort to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. These are the Jesus principles that made our recovery right. possible. One, we admitted that we were powerless over our addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. <clears throat> Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact natures of our wrong. Six, we had, were entirely ready to give, to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, we humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, we made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all of our affairs over. This sounds like a big order and we can't do it all at once. We didn't become addicted in one day, so remember, he does, he does it. There's one thing more than anything else that will defeat us in our recovery, and this is an attitude of indifference or intolerance towards spiritual principles. Three of these that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. With these, we are well on our way. 
We feel that our approach to the disease of addiction is completely realistic. For the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. We feel that our way is practical, for one addict can best understand and help another addict. We believe that the sooner we face our problems within our society and everyday living, just that much faster do we become acceptable, responsible, and productive members of that society. The only way to keep from returning to active addiction is not to take the first drug. If you're like us, you know that one is too many, and a thousand is never enough. We put great emphasis on this, for we know that when we use drugs in any form or substitute one for another, we release our addiction all over again. Thinking of alcohol as different from other drugs has caused a great many addicts to relapse. Before we came to NA, many of us viewed alcohol separately. We cannot afford to be confused about this. Alcohol is a drug, hmm. and we are people with a disease of addiction who must abstain from all drugs in order to recover. Thank you. Thank you. And somebody's going to read the 12 traditions, front only. I'm Marcia, I'm mad. Hey, Marcia. We keep what we have on the vigilance. As just as freedom for the individual comes from the 12 steps, so freedom for the group springs from our traditions. As long as the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that would tear us apart, all will be well. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on NA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he made for us himself and our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. Four, each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or NA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. Six, an NA, to, NA group ought never endorse finance or lend to NA members to any related facility or outside enterprise, less problems of money, property, or prestige to guard us from our primary purpose. Seven, every NA group ought to be fully supporting declining outside contributions. Eight, Narcotics Anonymous should remain forever non professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, NA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10. Narcotics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the NA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. 11. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need to always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Understanding these traditions comes slowly over people of time. We pick up information as we talk to members and visit various groups. It usually isn't until we get involved in service that someone points out that personal recovery depends on in a unity, and that unity depends on how well we follow our traditions. The 12 traditions of NA are non-negotiable. They are the guidelines that keep our fellowship alive and free. By following these guidelines in our dealings with others and society at large, we avoid new problems. That is not to say that our traditions eliminate all problems. You still have to, <coughs> me, still have to face difficulties as they arise. Communication problems, differences of opinion, internal controversies and troubles with individuals and groups outside the fellowship. However, when we apply these principles, we avoid some of the pitfalls. Many of our problems are like those that our predecessors had to face. Their hard-won experience gave birth to the traditions, and our own experience has shown that these principles are just as valid today as they were when these traditions were formulated. Our traditions protect us from the Truth. Our traditions protect us from the internal and external forces that can destroy us. They are truly the ties that bind us together. It's only through understanding and application that they work. Uh, our, this topic, this workshop is on losing loved ones and recovery. And our first speaker is Lauren, and she's my great 
grand sponsor. And when I'm in a rather large sponsorship tree, and when I heard that she was had joined our family, I couldn't be more thrilled. And being having that many women in in that group, I couldn't think of any other woman that I'd rather have joined our family that had such great recovery. So I give you Lauren. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kathy. Hey, I'm Lauren, and I'm an addict. Hey, Hello. Lauren. Thank you all for coming here so early on a Saturday morning when we all three got here, and there no, was not one person in the room. I was like, well, this will be interesting. So thank you all for, for appearing. It's like uh, the fish story. Um, so anyways, so I'm Lauren. I'm an addict. I um, got clean here in Atlanta, Georgia. 28 years ago, 27, no, 28 <laughs> years ago, yeah, because of like 20, anyways, 28 years ago, and Kathy was here when I got clean, um, and they, they texted me a couple nights ago, I live in Roswell, I wasn't coming till this afternoon to the convention, and a couple, I work full time, and uh, a couple days ago, Tony sent me a thingy on, you know, Facebook or whatever, and said, hey, you know, can you speak Saturday, Saturday, so I'm like, well, what time, and he said it's on the loss of a loved one, and, and and then I said, well, what time? He said, 9 a.m. And I was like, and I've learned, I'm trying really hard now in recovery not to say yes to everything immediately because I get resentful. I say yeah. yes when I don't want to say yes, and I get a resentment. So I was really learning, and I thought, I first, I, so I didn't respond. I waited a whole night. I thought about it, and I thought, gosh, of course I'll do this. You know, when I've lost people in recovery, the fellowship has totally showed up for me. So, you know, so I'm going to, of course, I'm going to say yes to this. But, you know, I had to think about it at first. And I thought, why would I say no, you know, to something that's been so freely given to me? So, and, um, I mean, there, there's a real, there's a reason why he pick, pick, asked me to do this. But um, I have lost a lot of people in recovery. As we, you know, we, you know you're know, you clean, you're 50, I'm 58. I got clean at 30, I'm 58. When I got clean at 30, the only thing I had ever lost that was important to me that I really wept over were animals. I mean, you know, like dogs. I had not, I had no experience with death, none. I had no grandparents that were involved in my life, so I lost no grandparents. I, you know, my father had left when I was a itty bitty baby. That was a loss, but it wasn't a death. You know, my, no siblings, no cousins, no aunts, no uncles, nobody had died other than like dogs. And, um, and I, you know, wept for days when an animal passed. It's different when a human dies. But, um, but, so and then I get clean and, um, you know, you, you get in the rooms and my hus I was married and the um, first person who passed away was my daughter's godmother. She died of AIDS and, she, you know, uh, and she died like shortly after my daughter was born and, she, and when we asked her, she said, you know, I'm dying. I, you know, this touches my heart so deeply that you would ask me. But, but we loved her and she was so excited about us having this baby that, that it just made sense. And, and her death was removed. It was in New York. I was, hadn't been clean that long. I was so disconnected still from who I was and what I was feeling that it, I don't know, it just didn't affect me the way future things happened. And then um, my sponsor's husband died. Uh, and I was there for her when he passed away. And I remember at the funeral, she wanted me next to her holding her hand, you know. I, you know, And, and then my sister's husband passed away. And, um, and she was young. She was like in her 40s. And I was clean at the time. And I went to um, Virginia. And my mom was there. My mother was like not a, um, at that time. She was a pretty bitter, angry woman. And there was the, like the churchy lady um, <coughs> and my, who like saw the family dynamics and she said instead of telling my sister's mother like I want you next to her she said she picked me and she said you sit and I remember thinking I was honored that she picked me that she could see that you know that that was um that I had some type of empathy I was developing empathy and, and I didn't have that when I first got clean I, you know I didn't have I was really void and empty of being a person anyway so let's fast forward so then I went through the death of my mother my mother had Alzheimer's and and you know it's different when your parent I mean we all uh, hopefully we'll lose our parents before they lose us right you know that's the natural progression of things my mother was almost 80 I'd been clean a good long time she was at a home right up the street from my house um, I was there all the time. My daughters were there. I got to be there for my mom in a way that, you know, I was with her when she, my, my stepfather, who I had a lot of issues with, had gone out to breakfast while she was ill because he had to go eat, you know, God forbid. And 
not ill, dying. I mean, there's a, you know, and there is a progression. There's a hospice nurse, there's a palliative care nurse. They all tell you, this is what's happening. This is how many days she's not eating. This is, you know, she can, anyway. So it's like, to me, it's like a total process. I, I, I'm okay with that. I, um, and I was, so there she was, she took her very last breath, he was in the bathroom, he had diarrhea, I was there with her alone, right? You know, but it was the way it was supposed to be, and before she passed away, Paul was, before she passed away though, I said, Mom, I said, um, and she, you know, and like I said, she had Alzheimer's, I said, Mom, it was probably like two days, I said, you, these were the very last time she acknowledged, like, the presence of a human being, I said, I know you're, you're leaving. I know you're leaving the world. You know, I said, I love you. I know you're leaving the world. I said, please, though, come back. My mother was super into animals and birds. And, you know, she was just a really that type of person. And I said, please come back and show me that. Give me messages. And she said, she shook her head. She said, okay. And, you know, that was the last communication she had with anybody before she died. And, and I, I believe she understood me. I totally believe she understood me. So I went, you know, so I go through that, and then I um, I was with one of my aunts. I had this dear aunt and uncle who lived up the street from me. And again, all this is clean, by the way. All these deaths are clean. And she was 90-some years old, and she um, was really, she, she was sick, and her husband, who was also 90, was in the room. And this was my aunt and uncle that lived within walking distance of my house growing up, and my mother worked all the time, so they helped raise me a lot. I, you know what I mean? I went to their house after school. I spent, when my mom traveled for work, they took care of me. So they were very much surrogate parents, loved them. And I was literally standing at my aunt when she took her last breath. So if you <laughs> don't have me around when you're dying, because I, anyway. <laughs> so no, I was with her, but you know, and then I was sad I stayed with my uncle a while. So I have experienced a lot of death, you know? I mean, it's. And I am a person who really believes it's a process and it is a part of life. And if you're old, it's okay, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to hang around when nothing works anymore. I'm, I'm not afraid of it. I'm so not afraid of it. And um, so, so then it, um, I, um, it was, it'll be five years this May, you know, and I got married in this program. I got pregnant and then I got married in this program. And I married a man who I was not madly in love with when we got married and we weren't, we got, you know, I was 30, he was, I think 35. He had, he had lost a child, it, um, a di baby died in utero with his second marriage. I was his third wife, his second marriage. And it was like a week before, a week or two before this baby was to be born. His mm -hmm. name was Zach, it was a little boy. And I don't know the whole story. He could never really tell it, but he, um, and then he got clean and, um, but he held this little baby. And so, you know, anyway, so then we get, we, so when I got pregnant, um, I was really careful. It's like the only time in my life I didn't use birth control. I got pregnant and I knew, I intuitively knew that I was going to have, I wasn't like I was going to have an abortion. I knew I was 30 some years old. I could handle this. I'd been clean two years, you know. I'd never had even pictured myself getting married and having children, but I thought, I'll, I'm going to have this baby. And he's like, well, I want to be a part of it. And so we, you know, a couple, we talked about it for a couple months and we said, well, we'll get married, you know? And um, so we did and we, and we grew and, oh my God, our marriage went through all this stuff. But so we have this little baby girl and um, then we have another little baby girl and we go to marital therapy, we stay clean, I'm going to, you know, we go to marital therapy, we go through a lot. We find out my step, my father-in-law had been molesting my older daughter and um, we go to take her to therapy, we go to the police, we do it, we turn his dad in, he, you know, um, and we went, we started going to see this therapist and, um, and the therapist actually said, she said, this is the type of thing that people get divorced. It's amazing, you know, if you guys are, and, and what happens is when something like that happens in a, in a, in a family, that the, 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 you know, there's so much pain and so much grief and so much anger that the couple can either both separate, go their separate ways and, you know, withdraw into themselves or they can work together. And, and we chose, you know, to work together. It was actually a unifying thing for us. Anyway, and, and it was, um, and because we, it, and it was really because of these rooms that we were able to do that and the support we got in here and what we learned through Narcotics Anonymous and working the steps and working a program and a spiritual and all that stuff is how come when she told us we were able to deal with it and, you know, and she's a thriving, healthy 26 year old woman today and um, 25 or 26, I think she's 26. But anyways, so, um, 
And so then what happens is the marriage progresses a little bit more and we're still, we go back and forth to therapy and it turns out he's, um, he has, he's a sex addict and he's having affairs. And, or not affairs, he's fucking people. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and, and you know what? And, um, and I think I had, 15, I had 15 years clean at the time and so did he and we were, he had a little bit more than I did. And, um, and I, we stayed married through that, you know? And again, that's the thing, you know, you either stay married or you get divorced. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I didn't choose to stay married the day it all came out. It, it, it was a, you mean it was a lot of therapy. It was a lot of marital therapy. I chose to stay in it because I knew that there was something wrong with me to pick somebody that was so sick. I mean, I was just as sick, let's face it. So anyway, so I'm telling you all of this because it leads up to like a, another loss and recovery. So we go through all of this stuff. I stay with him, this man. He stays with me. And I, you know, I wasn't a piece of cake to be married to for a lot of that time. So anyway, so, um, and you know what? I, you know, we started our marriage not in love, you know, and and we got to a place where we really, really, really loved one another, and we really loved one another. And we've been through all of this, right? All this stuff, and you know, we're at a good place. Our daughter's a junior in college. We have another daughter who's a junior in high school. They're beautiful, well-adjusted, you know, um, smart, good girls. You know, it's like, wow, we're going to be empty nesters. You know, we're looking forward to this period. Like, you know, we're not these people that are like, oh, my God, our children are leaving. What are we going to do? We're like, oh, my God, our children are leaving. This is so much fun. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we, we're like, whoa, you know, we see the, the light at the end of the tunnel with all of this. And, and, and we were great parents together, and he was a great dad. And anyways, what happened is he calls me from work one day and says, um, Lauren, I'm, and I just started this new job. And he goes, Lauren, I I'm, and this was almost five years ago. He says, Lauren, I'm, I'm having chest pains. Their ta Bob called um, the ambulance, and an ambulance is coming. And I had just switched jobs, and I was the insurance person. And what I was thinking was, God damn it, now I'm going to have to pay for Cobra. I really thought that, but for a second, okay? I didn't say it, thank God. So um, I didn't say it. And I said, are you sure you have to go to the hospital? Or I don't know what I said. And I just said, what hospital are you going to? And he said, I can't talk, I can't, I can't talk, I can't talk. Anyway, so and he, and he died within 10 minutes of that phone call. That man died right there. They had the paddle things, the amp, you know. I don't know any of this. But so, so, um, and that was May 19th, 2011. And on May 12th was my birthday. And mother, I was born on a Mother's Day. So my birthday and Mother's Day are always like at the same time, within a days of each other. Anyways. So, and then his birthday was May 16th. So it's Mother's Day, my birthday, his birthday, May 16th, and he died on May 19th. So it was like, like I used to love May. I used to love spring. I used to love that time of the year. And now that week is, I want to die. You know, it's getting better, but I just want to put those dates in perspective because it's like, holy shit, you know? And, and our anniversary, wedding anniversary was July 17th. So it was like right after that. But the point is, um, so I go to the hospital and um, is, is he's got a really good friend in the program. His name's Bobby DiResta, Bobby D. And they had called, the, the, his, his work had called because they knew he was dead and they needed someone at the hospital to, you know, because they knew I was going there too. And they called this guy Bobby. They didn't tell me he died, but they said, can you go to the hospital, Gary? He had, you know. So, um, and I had called back the work to say, I don't want him going to DeKalb Medical. I want him going to St. Joe because that's a better heart center. And I, you know, figured it was his heart. And they were like, no, 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 they're taking him to DeKalb. And they said, well, you know, anyway. And I could tell something was up, but I didn't know what. And while I was driving down uh, 285 to get there, I called my sponsor named Katie T, same sponsor I've had for 20, well, all my whole time I've been clean. I called her, and she lives on a farm, um, I don't know, an hour and a half outside of Atlanta now. But she just happened to be in Decatur that day. Like once a month, she comes to Decatur. So this is God. You know, you got I got God all over the place in my life. My God. So, or higher power. So, um, so Katie, I, and I'm like, oh my God, Katie, I just got a call. And I'm also a woman who typically handles things by myself. I'm not a big, I mean, I would like to say I'm not a drama queen. I probably am, but, um, you know what I mean? I, 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 whatever. I don't. I don't know. I don't like to make a big fuss and have all these people fuss over me. So I didn't, I just kept thinking I was going to get to the hospital and they going to say we're going to have to change his diet. I'm like, you know, whatever they need, we'll do. Um, 
but I called Katie and I said, you know, I got this call and she goes, you know, I'll meet you there. And there's another woman in the program, Karen F. And she's the one who had actually gotten my husband this job. And I called her and I said, I said, oh my God, you know, this guy Bob called, I'm trying to get all back to the office. I can't, I, I, I was confused at that time. I don't have the number, whatever. And she goes, you know, Lauren, I'm not doing anything. I'll meet you at the hospital. I mean, this is the middle of a work day. So these women were doing something. So they met me at the hospital. Bobby, D, well, they got there in a minute. Bobby D was sitting there. He had his little daughter there. The, they, long story short, they, cut, they bring me back to a little room because I kept saying, how is he? Can I see him? Is he talking? Is he cognizant? How is he? And they were like, weird. Nobody's telling me anything. So they bring me in this room and they tell me he died. But, you know, they, like, she's telling me this. And I was, all of us, and I finally said, what are you saying? Because you trust me, y'all. You just, yeah. What are you saying? I said, just say it. What are you saying? And they were telling me in this real roundabout way that this guy, he, my husband died. And so she says, well, I'm sorry, you know, he, he passed away. And I was like, well, take that back. I said, you cannot say that. You take it back. And, you know, like a five-year-old. And, um, you know, they can't take it back. And then I was like thinking, well, you know, how, and then Katie came, and then Karen comes, and thank God, I mean, how was God not in all this, that these people, should, I mean, I just thought, like, he had a heart problem, we didn't know he was dead, and um, anyway, so, ugh, God, so that's how this, you know what I mean, that's like my big death in recovery, that's why Tony Owens, or whatever, said, come do this, and, um, it, you know, and it's like it, like all of that's a fog. I got through all the, everything. NA, all the people in the program just carried me. My neighbors carried me. I cannot tell you every and I knew it while all this was happening that 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 um, my higher power was helping me and my girls. You know, the first night, the very you know, I had to tell my kids that their dad was gone. And um, you know, anyways, in the first you get this headache like. Like the, within three minutes of them telling me he was dead, I had this raging headache, and my girls got this raging headache, you know. And um, we had a, one daughter was on a trip. The older daughter was down at some uh, musical jam down in. A, she just finished her first semester. I mean, her last semester of her junior year in college, and she was at some music thing in Mobile, Alabama, and we had to get her back without telling her Gary had died. And I, when I told my little one that Gary had died, she thought I literally thought I told her the dog had died. And she goes, Mommy, that's okay. We can get another one. And I was like, oh, God, no, Casey. It's, you know, it's not. And, um, you know, we were estranged from his mother and father because of the molestation thing. And Gary had just, before he died, a daughter that he had fathered um, when he was married to somebody else. Um, before me had appeared, which is really a beautiful miracle thing that she got to meet him before he died, and you know, and um, but you know, I didn't want to use. I'm going to be. Honest, I did not want to use at all. I just because I wasn't going to do anything, and um, but the first night, my daughters and I, we all I had a king size bed, and we all slept in the bed together. And we waited till like three or four in the morning because she didn't. We didn't want to go to bed because we'd go to bed, and then it was like. You know, what do you do? You, oh, my God. And, and they said, Mommy, we want to sleep with you. And I really wanted to be alone, you know, because I had had, like, I hadn't even thought yet. Like, what the hell? So we get in this bed, and um, I'm laying there, and I had my first spirit. I've had, a, I've had little spiritual awakenings throughout being clean, but I had a spiritual awakening. And I'm sorry, because I didn't, I don't want to talk. Oh, God, I have, like, two more minutes. Um, I'm going to take a little bit longer, because we have, like, till 9, 1030. Yeah. Okay, I'll try. Yeah. So, um, anyway... So I laid there and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to raise these girls? I've got, I'm by myself. How am I going to raise these girls? And I got, had this literally like voice saying, I'll help you, Lauren. And it was Gary. You know what I mean? Like, like we had done this together up to that point. So I knew that. I was like, okay, thank you. You know, you'll be here for me. And, um, you know, it just, I, I brought some stuff. I'm not going to read all. Oh, yeah. So he was gone a couple days, and I it, it didn't even I didn't even call. Like one daughter was in high school, and a neighbor lady finally said, "Lauren, if you called the high school, do you know?" Because she was had all these tests, and so she called the principal, and they all knew. And we made this service for Gary, where over 500 people showed up to his service. That's the kind of guy he was, and you knew him. You know, mm -hmm. he was that kind of guy. He was love. You know, after all the stuff we'd been to, that 
like if you pictured Gary, you would picture a man with his arms held out like this, you know, because that was him. Um, there was, I must have had, um, I had this friend named Mindy, she's since passed away, my Nancy and I were there for her, but she said, what can I do to help you? And I said, take my cell phone. I had 27 phone messages I haven't even listened to, and I said, they're all going to be the same. They're going to be a man, and they're going to be someone, and they're going to say, oh my God, Lauren, I just heard, and then they're going to start to cry, and then you're not going to know what they're saying. I said, but you know, they're all, so she did, she did, she wrote them all down, and she said there were like two that she could understand, but it was all, and it was his sponsees, and I felt responsible, you know, these sponsees, and you know, and all these girls I had, so um, he was dead just a couple days, and, and I, Here's the deal. I had this choice to make, you know, um, and I was, I was, I, all of a sudden it dawned on me, like, oh my God, did he, he, he had life insurance, right? We had two incomes. We didn't have a lot of money in savings. You know, we were like the typical addict family living paycheck to paycheck. And so anyways, but I thought, oh my God, did he, and he had hep C, he had chronic active hep C, so he couldn't really get very much life insurance. And um, when we had our first daughter, he did get as much as he could. And it was costing him a lot more. He was 58 when he died, and um, it was costing him a lot more, and he had just started this new job, and I had said, you know, if you want to stop paying for it, stop paying for it, because I know it's, you know, and uh, he died, and I thought, oh, fudge, did he stop paying? It was just like three months prior we had that conversation, and it, it was a couple days later I thought, oh, God, and I went online, and I was looking through his banking stuff to see it, and I was thinking, why God, why God, why God, why God did you fucking do this to me? You know, I mean, my daughter had been molested. The guy cheated on me. My dad left when I was little. I mean, we got all this shit. Like, is this another thing you're giving me? You know, like, why me? And, um, and I was looking online to see. And I also, I will say this. I tried, like, heck to keep it all together for my girls. I'm proud of that. that you know what I mean? Like, they didn't need a mom to fucking lose her shit. So I did as best I could. Um, so I'm sitting there at my computer, and I'm looking to see, did he keep up the life insurance? Can I keep this house? And it hit me. Oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to keep the house. And I had this thing posted on my, 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 um, by my, my, my computer. And it was a daily meditation a woman that um, I'm friends with in the program had sent me. And, it just, and this is what it was. And I had been reading it like every day before he died. And it was, I am valuable. I am loved. God has a great plan for my life. I have favor wherever I go. God's blessings are chasing me down and overtaking me. Everything I touch prospers, prospers and succeeds. I am excited about my future. And I looked at that and I was like, you have a choice, Lauren. You can either be bitter and angry and, or you can believe this, that I'm valuable and I am loved and you know what I mean? And even though my husband was gone and I was a widow at a really, at a way before I thought I would ever be, I could believe this and I chose to believe that, you know? So I don't know, that, that helped me a lot. To me that was like almost another, yet another little mini spiritual awakening. So, okay guys, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna read one thing. I have more to read, but I'm not because this is taking me too long. Um, it's been f almost five years. It'll be five years this May. I miss him still every day. My girls, you know, we've been through a lot, but we've, we've made it. And I, this is the one thing I say, is the one thing that he taught me was unconditional love. Be you know, um, he was the person who, in the marriage who looked at the world as, as the glass is half full. I was the woman who looked at it as half empty. I now look at things much more half full. I've taken that on. After he died, my daughter Kara was like, Mom, Dad was the one who hugged and kissed and said, I loved you every day. You've got to step up now. You, you know what I mean? That was, you got to do that now. I was more reserved or whatever. And she was also like, Mom, Dad was the optimist. Um, you got to be that now. You know, girl, I mean, my daughters are wise. Um, and um, the one thing, this, you know, these are the things, and these are the things that, got, I mean, this is the stuff. Every flipping widow or widower can probably say the same things. But um, like I wrote, I couldn't even write in my journal. I journal a lot, and I couldn't write. It was two months after he died, and all I, I, I was a, two women took me on a trip, friends from college, and uh, we were at this beautiful place, and they're both married and successful, and you know all this crap. And I, <laughs> but I was okay with it. I even wrote about the fact that I'm not really jealous. You know, my life is different. And I have this program, thank God for this program, but all I wrote, dear God, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm being attacked by life. I feel so darn alone, unanchored, anxious, fearful, sad, lost. I feel tired. 
I need your love, guidance, and assurance. I need someone's arms around me to hug and hold me, tell me everything is going to be okay, isn't it? God, and then I, I love the third step prayer. I use it all the time in different ways. And dear God, I offer myself to thee. Do with me as thy will. Protect me and guide me. Show me the way. Take away my suffering. Free me from the bondage of self. Reveal to me my true purpose. Give me the strength and courage to carry on. Infuse my spirit with gratitude and self-confidence. Fill me with peace. Allow me to prosper. Help me lead my family and honor my husband. I am so sad that you took him away so suddenly. But what's really cool is all this stuff has happened to me. I mean, all of this has occurred. My heart is so full today. And um, I didn't date for almost four years, three and a half years. And I started dating again and I fell in love. And today I can love in a way I never could love before. And it's all because of this, you know? All because of this there were times after he passed away I wanted to die I never wanted to use I just and I really did I had to go to therapy like three years in because I saw no purpose anymore to be going on it was just my girls and I'm like you know they're gone but anyways so thank you <laughs> for letting me share thank you guys for showing up this morning thanks thank you. Thank you. you know for me a couple of years ago, Hannah was cheering, and I was cheering on, I don't remember what topic, but for me, it's like we pass each other in the rooms, we may not really know each other, but we're kind of coming full circle here today, so, you know, I don't even know what area she's from or what her home group is, but I know her, because we, you know, we pass each other, you know, to me, Coming to Grick every year is really important because to me it's like a reunion. And, you know, I went to the first Grick and so that's why it's so important for me every year to be able to keep coming to Grick uh, So I give you Hannah. Hey guys, I'm an addict named Hannah. Hey, hey Hannah. Hannah. And, um, I'm just gonna take a minute to breathe. I, um, I've experienced two different kinds of losses of loved ones and recovery. Um, one is death, but one is the ending of relationships. And um, they are, for me, both just as painful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both. Um, I, got, I got clean in 2007. Um, and... Uh, early on lost my great-grandmother who um, I was really close to um, she was well, close as you can be when you never live in the same state as someone um, but she uh, she was born in 1911 she was 96 years old when she died um, she uh, she lived a long life and when she was born uh, she you know there wasn't even electricity in her town yet you know, in South Alabama. She was the first woman that had a child out of wedlock in her town, my grandfather. We started early, man. Um, and, and I just remember the fact that in the last few years, I was the only grandchild or great-grandchild she could recognize. So that was always special to me. And it wasn't, and I, I like how you said, like it was early in recovery. I was still kind of finding myself. I didn't really even know how to experience mm -hmm. grief. Um, and so it took a long time to mourn that relationship, mostly because I didn't know what, what that was. I didn't know what those feelings were. And when you can't identify feelings, it's hard to process them. Um, and several years later, I, I lost my another grandmother, um, that's the first person I've ever seen die. Um, I was in the room, and there is something eerie about watching the spirit leave the body. It, it is very different. Um, one minute it's there, and the next minute it is definitely not there. And I um, was able to walk with my mother through that time. Um, I was in undergrad, and I um, flew out to Texas to be with my family. We weren't actually expecting her to die. I was just there to help move her into a different home. Um, but that, that 
didn't work out and uh, I happened to be there and um, I didn't pick up uh, but seeing someone die greatly affected me and I did start smoking again after 11 months mm. of not smoking um, so the, the the disease of addiction is um, is there to help I say help because it did for a long time it helped me not feel the emotions that were so strong uh, I didn't I didn't want to live and so when I started smoking again, it numbed it just enough that I could manage through it. Um, so fast forward a couple years later, and uh, I'm living in Philadelphia. I'm clean. I'm getting my undergraduate. I graduate. I decide to work for a nonprofit in Thailand. So um, instead of going straight into grad school, I took a year off. I raised some money, and I moved to Thailand. And, um, my higher power works in these really weird ways, right? So I, I had uh, all all this money in a bank account because I'm meant to live on it for a whole year, um, and decided to do that instead of I, I had gotten <laughs> I had gotten accepted into Princeton and uh, for graduate school, and I turned it down to go to Thailand, and people thought I was fucking nuts, <laughs> uh, you know, like. Um, I could defer acceptance, but the reality was I, I probably would never end up going there if I did. And uh, but I let I let that go so I could go to Thailand because that's where I felt my my higher power wanted me. That's where I felt I could be useful. And so I went to Thailand with the belief that I was going to be there for a full year. I was there for three months uh, and one day uh, when I got a call that my brother's cancer had returned. He had had uh, brain cancer 10 years ago. And after like eight years of this type of cancer, they stopped checking because it's considered in full remission. And so they hadn't been checking for it. Um, and so by the time they found something wrong, it was uh, bigger than a golf ball sized tumor in the base of his <coughs> skull. And uh, I was in Thailand and I made some calls to my donors and let them know I was gonna be using their funds to come back to the United States. And um, there was like four women that I lived with in this house. They're not in recovery, um, but they were, uh, I have found that people in recovery are badass. I have also found that normies are fully capable of being that same presence in my life. Um, so I get off the phone, it was about eight o'clock in the morning. I'd just come back from a jog. Uh, and I don't know how I looked, but the look on my face and this girl, Christine was like, what, what's wrong? And I told her uh, my brother's tumor was back and I needed to get home. And so she got on my laptop and bought a flight while another girl packed my bags and another one, you know, like they just, they took care of everything for me. And uh, within 12 hours, I was on a flight back to the United States and landed less than 24 hours since they discovered my brother's uh, cancer was back. And. Um, I landed with him in brain surgery. So I landed in Atlanta after being up for, I don't know, 30 hours, knowing he was either coming out or still in brain surgery with no cell phone. Uh, and so I talked to the person next to me on the airplane. He's like, yes, please use my phone. Um, and, uh, you know, and um, one of my dad's church members met me at the airport and they took me to the hospital and he was awake and fine when I got there. Sometime during this period of my life clean, uh, I became an adult. Um, at this point, I've been clean for four years, and I had grown up. Uh, I paid for my own schooling. I paid my own bills. I lived on my own. I raised enough money. People trusted me with thousands and thousands of dollars in a bank account to go to Thailand. Um, you know, like I had grown up in recovery and uh, when I landed, it was quickly made evident to me that during this period that I had grown up, my parents had regressed. And um, I turned into the adult in this whole situation and they turned into teenagers. They couldn't handle it, man. When they, um, we were hoping that the tumor wasn't malignant, that it was just, uh, a subsequent tumor and when they found that it was the cancer it was me who was at the hospital that told my brother it was me who was there at five and six o'clock in the morning when the doctors made rounds it was it was me that my brother made medical power of attorney it was me you know I I had to step in um, because there was a real fear that they wouldn't 
Um, during this time, uh, I met a man, because that's what I do. Um, I moved to Georgia, and my brother is in the hospital, and um, I was living at his place because my parents are crazy. And I met I met a man, and then he moved me in three weeks later, and because that's how we do. And um, and and within three months, my brother was dead. It took three months. Um, during all this time, my parents are praying for miracles, and uh, I was just praying for acceptance. Um, before his second brain surgery, there was a second one in there. Um, he had told me he didn't want treatment if it was back, and uh, the man brain surgery will change a person uh, emotionally, like it just affects shit. Uh, and my parents had convinced him to get treatment, even though he didn't want it. Um, and I, even as a medical power of attorney, didn't feel like I should fight that. Me and my parents fought a lot during that time. The last three weeks before he died, I had gotten to a point where I, he, we had to move him into their home because I could not take care of him on my own anymore. And uh, they were so overwhelmingly, what, I don't know what they were, but I couldn't deal. And um, I had not been over there uh, in a couple weeks. And uh, I finally got to the point where I was not going to let them and their crazy affect my relationship with my brother, who I knew was dying, even if they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I made a commitment that I would be there on Monday nights to help take care of my brother. And um, that I almost canceled because that Monday night was my clean date. It was my five-year anniversary, and I wanted to pick up a key tag. But I decided my commitment at this point to my brother was more important. And I went and I stayed with him and it was a horrible experience. Um, he had gained so much weight from the medications that I couldn't lift him anymore. It was hard to get him out of the bed when he wanted to. It was not a joyful experience. It was really traumatic trying to take care of this man that I loved and um, couldn't. And then the next morning I got a call that he had passed away in his sleep. Um, so the end was not joyous, but I was there anyway. Mm -hmm. And that next night, I showed up at a meeting and I picked up my five-year key tag. Because when shit gets rough for me, I show up at meetings. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I mean, hell could be coming up from the, the, the bottom of the earth and zombies roaming the world. And if I'm having trauma, a bitch shows up at a meeting. And, uh, and that's what I did. In Northeast Georgia at that time, in Gainesville, there was not a lot of women with clean time that went to meetings consistently. And so I had like something like 15 sponsees in the three months that I had been there. It was really the only thing keeping me sane. Because as much as 15 newcomers might make you crazy, it was still more sane than my parents. So that is what I dove into. And um, I did want to get high. I wanted, that was my biggest reservation. I wrote about it on my first four step that if my brother ever died, I didn't know uh, if I could stay clean through it. I started using the first time in the middle of his cancer the first time. And so I wanted to get high. But at that time, of my 15 sponsees, over half of them had had a sponsor that had used. And I refused to be that bitch. I refused to be that girl that left those women when they needed me most. And so I grieved. I grieved and I cried at meetings after meeting after meeting, and I didn't pick up. And I let those women see me grieve, and they came with me to get a memorial tattoo, and they stayed with me when, when me and my boyfriend at the time were fighting. And they, uh, you know, they stuck with me. They were at the funeral. They, I mean, they, by me grieving, I gave them an opportunity to show up for me, and um, I didn't get high. I didn't get high. Um, and grief is a fickle fuck, though. It uh, it eased up after a while, and I thought I was getting better. I thought uh, thought I was handling this life thing. I stayed moved in with the boyfriend. We fought a lot, but 
Uh, six months into the relationship, we bought a house together because that seemed like a really good idea. Uh, and then six months after that, I married him. So I kept him. Um, but during during that time, I just I thought I thought things were better, you know, like I was had getting this relationship, and um, my parents were even more insane after my brother died, and um, they had always been codependent. But now my old my oldest brother passed away when I was using 15 years ago. Um, so they now only had one kid left, and I was it, and I was the center of of it and they went off the deep end. If I was there, I wasn't doing good enough and if I wasn't there, I should be there. And there, uh, so things, things I thought were, were better. <coughs> and, uh, and then I woke up one day and I just didn't want to do it anymore. The relationship was too hard and recovery was too much and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life I had been accepted into Princeton, and then now the thought of getting in, going to graduate school made me want to die inside a little. That there was nothing that I once loved that I wanted to do anymore. And um, December the following year, I uh, finally got a therapist. I've been and and, and re reached out for outside help off and on my whole recovery, but thought I had this shit figured out. Like, I'd already lost one brother. I knew how to do this shit. Like, I got this down. And, um, and that was not the case. Um, grief is fickle. And it comes and goes and hits you upside the head when a stupid Blink-182 song comes on that you used to listen to on the way to high school uh, with your brother in the car. You know, like, it is crazy. And, um, and I was not able to handle <coughs> the cycle of grief. And um, so I had to reach for outside help. And um, that outside help allowed me to see that the relationship with my parents was making it harder to get through the grief. Um, and I made the most difficult decision I've made clean, and that was to cut them off from my life for almost nine months while I healed. I could not heal with them in it. They was too sick. And um, part of that was because I was so sick um, so for nine months I, I didn't speak with them and um, and I worked through my grief I worked with a therapist and I did step work and I went to meetings I was going to four or five meetings a week uh, I worked I talked to my friends I just kept going I visited the graveside every other week um, there was not a time in that nine month period that I wasn't doing something constructive for myself. I quit smoking and this time I made it, I made a commitment that it was going to be the last time I would quit and I did and um, and then and then I got pregnant. Um, and it was uh, three and a half years ago I got pregnant and um, I was told early in recovery that it would be difficult for me to conceive. And uh, so I was in the doctor's office relatively quickly to make sure everything was okay. And um, they said it was. It looked like I had a, a cyst on one of my ovaries, but not a big deal. Um, but that it looked fine. Uh, it was too early to have a heartbeat or anything like that. I'd found it really early. Uh, but then a couple weeks I started to have a major pain on my right side. Major pain. And I went in and they told me I was, I was losing the baby. And... Um, but something wasn't right. I still felt pregnant. At this point, my hormones were low enough that I should not feel pregnant. But everything about my body still felt pregnant. And they're like, you're not pregnant. You're crazy. Um, and a week later, I was still having these major pains. And I went in. I was like, I am pregnant. And they checked. And I had, uh, I made them check. And um, they found that the pregnancy had been in my tube. And I don't know if you guys know much about tubal pregnancies, but they can be deadly. Um, the fetus had been growing. It was now almost nine weeks along and uh, would have had a heartbeat if it had been viable and was in my tube. Uh, so something uh, the size of a quarter was in a tube the size of a penny. Um, and they gave me a drug to help try and flush it out. But by Saturday, it was in, I was in so much pain 
I had to call a friend in recovery who lived down the street. She put me in her car and rushed me to the hospital, and uh, it had ruptured. And um, I was in danger of bleeding out and dying. And uh, so nine months into the decision to allow myself to grieve and to heal, I did not want to die on the operating table and my parents not know. And so I talked with um, my still boyfriend at the time and told him I wanted to let him know, that let my parents know where I was, but that he was in charge of my medical decisions because we had talked about it. And, um, and so we called my parents. And... Um, Y'all, that shit is nothing to fuck around with. And uh, within 20 minutes of being in the ER, they had me in the back, were getting me stripped, and were putting me on the operating table. I was, they were getting the clothes off of me while I was still not sedated. Um, so it was, it was really, really scary. And I lost my first baby that day. You know, it was, um, my, that baby would be three and a half years old. And um, shortly after that, we got engaged because there's nothing like losing a child to make you feel like you want to get married. Um, I, I don't know that I always handle this grief stuff well, right? Like I find distractions everywhere I go. Like my brother gets sick and I, I get a man and move in and uh, I, I lose a baby and we get engaged. Like the, these are not necessarily the best ways to go about it, but they have worked so far for me. <laughs> and so with a therapist on one side and a wedding on the other, we, we dove in, you know. And since then I have been, maintained a relationship with my parents. I would not say that it is a good one. And I hold them at arm's length because if you give a mouse a muffin, it'll want a glass of milk. And my parents are definitely the codependent mouse that will take as much as they can out of my emotional well-being. Um, during that nine-month period, I want, I want to go back and just say that that period was a huge time of grief, not just because I lost my brother, but because I realized for the first time I didn't really have parents. Uh, my, my sponsor had called it uh, emotional and passive neglect. Mm -hmm. And that had been what I had my whole life. They had, I hear you share about taking care of your daughter during her time of abuse. My parents knew about my abuse and did nothing. And like, I ache, I would ache for the need and the want to have parents who could see past their own shit to take care of me. And they couldn't, and they didn't. And so I mourned during that time, not just my brother, but the realization that not only did I not have parents, but I wouldn't. They don't have a program. They're not in a process of, they don't want a process of change. And I had to either come and accept them the way they are and maintain a relationship with them the way they were, or I could just not have one. And on that table that day, realizing that my own death was probable. At that point, I was bleeding out. Uh, that it's funny how your own <laughs> your own mortality will make you realize what's important. I decided that um, I wanted a relationship with them. I wanted them there. I did not want them to suffer. And sometimes a relationship is just not about wanting someone to suffer. It doesn't mean you gotta like them. <laughs> it's just about not wanting someone to suffer. And uh, I love them enough that I didn't want them to suffer. So I, uh, they were there that day and they, they've been in my life ever since. I, I did have a second miscarriage. It was not as brutal as the first, um, but that was a whole other loss. Um, I grieved much harder for that one. And that was because after the surgery, I was on pain medication. There's nothing like major surgery. I mean, there was no way to get through it without. And um, so I didn't feel a lot of the stuff the subsequent days. I didn't feel the contractions really afterwards, which happened. I did not feel. And in the second one, like I gave, I gave birth. And it was horrible and awful. And during that time, my sponsee had a child and I was there for the birth while I was losing my own. And, um, you know, loss and grief can be a lot of different things. Losing loved ones in recovery doesn't mean people that necessarily have been around a while. Sometimes it's people you never got the opportunity to meet. And um, so I married my husband and uh, we're, we're working through life because life is weird 
Um, and I did end up having a child. He was here yesterday, he's seven months, and he's the cutest little thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, and I too have like a season of grief. My oldest brother died on December 21st, or his birthday was December 21st. He died on the 29th. Um, David died on January 3rd. His birthday is February 27th. Uh, you know, Christmas is the 20th, you know, all that bullshit. And um, usually the just the month of December, January, and February, fucking horrible for me. I fucking hate it. Um, and this is the first year, like, I haven't hated it. And the only difference is the presence of my son. Um, it is a healing love to be able to love something outside of yourself. And um, during this time of year, I used to go volunteer. Like, I would go and find a place where I was needed 